So we'll continue our discussion with newly diagnosed myeloma. Lots of new data presented, but I want to focus on a couple of new trials that were updated. And one was Alcyon, which looked at VMP plus or minus DARA. And this is the first time that we see DARA presented now in the newly diagnosed setting in a relapse in a phase three trial. And we'll also have updated data now from the MRC11 trial, again, looking at revenue maintenance post-transplant. And so I think two important pieces of data. And so your thoughts on that and how that impacts newly diagnosed myeloma and your approach for initial therapy. So. Yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, the, the data on DARA up front uh, supports what I think we all know in our, in our minds, which is that DARA plus anything is better than anything um, in a randomized trial. Um, I think the use of VMP as the control arm makes it a little bit challenging for us to extrapolate this data for our daily practice. Um, and I think as we think about DARA being brought up front, we have to think about what are the right endpoints to measure benefit for adding that fourth drug in. Is it MRD negativity at four cycles? Is it MRD negativity at eight cycles? What's the right benchmark? Because I think that, to me, is a little bit, it's, it's the big question. Sure. Yeah, Dr. Matthews, again, presented nice data from her international trial, um, VMP plus minus DARA. Um, I can only echo what Dr. Loniel already mentioned, that the data for the U.S. market are of limited value because I think we rarely use VMP. I think we almost all of us excluded melphalan from our daily practice. Uh, but again, it really underscores the concept and that DARA upfront can really change um, the progression-free survival and the depths of response. I think she presented also nice data on MRD negativity and her data clearly showed an advantage of DARA 2 to map. So if we say that MRD is the kind of you know, probably a future new endpoint, I think that study clearly showed that DARA should probably be a part of future frontline treatments. Yeah, I think this is the first of a, a probably more to come era of four drug regimens and starting to show benefit over three drugs. And I think the other thing is uh, that I echo that mm. uh, nobody in the United States, uh, I think, uses VMP. The question is, uh, if this uh, gets uh, FD approval and uh, DARA is approved for frontline use, can we use it off-label with other combinations? Um, that I, I'm a little skeptical that will happen, but if it does, that will allow us to use maybe DARA with other drugs that we are more likely to use it with RevDEX or revlimid velcade uh, dex uh, combinations. Uh, um, but uh, I think uh, if it doesn't happen, the DRD versus uh, RD trial will probably read re re out next year, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. frontline, yeah. yeah. You know, I think that the, it's quite impressive to see how the Spanish group, this was a Janssen sponsored study, how they were able to build on their old VISTA combination with Velcade, Malcolm, yeah. Prednisone. In such a short period of time, involved 700 patients yeah. uh, together with multi centers. Uh, and presented here at ASH. Uh, it happened very fast. Uh, and in fact, the paper came out today in the New England Journal of Medicine as an original paper. So I just saw it this morning online. Uh, I think that's very impressive. I agree with everything that we have heard that I don't think it's going to really impact the treatment landscape here in the United States because we don't use malphalan or prednisone. Uh, I think I used it 10 years ago or something like that when I worked <laughs> in Europe. Uh, I think it's important for other countries outside the United States for sure. Uh, I also think that the message uh, of uh, hazard ratios uh, kind of is something we can look into here. So the hazard ratio is actually quite impressive. It's a 50% reduction, but the control arm is also very inferior. So when we look at hazard ratios, the first thing you should do is to also to see what the control group delivers, because if you have a very poor control group, it's very easy to get a good hazard ratio. Um, they reported 20% MOD rates in the combination of daratumumab with VMP. Uh, just to put it in context, if you use RVD, uh, you probably have about the 40% or so uh, MOD rate with the MOD assays they have used in this paper. This is flow-based assays. And if you use KOD, you can probably take it up to 60%. So although we don't have head-to-head -head in randomizations, I think there is some direction from those early surrogate markers to and to your point with MRD, I think there's two questions on that. One is the actual endpoint of MRD in these newly diagnosed trials, but the actual thing you mentioned was the time as well. So when should you be doing that as well? So four months, eight months for transplant ineligible patients should be doing it at 12 months after they get full therapy. So any thoughts on that in terms of when we should be looking at that? Um, yeah, I think I think that's a that's 
I don't think we have any idea. Yeah. Um, you know, I think MRD is not a static endpoint, and so I think having sustained MRD negativity is what probably has the most meaningful value. Does it mean anything at cycle four? I don't think we know. I mean, it'd be obviously it's good, but the sustained MRD is like Bart's old CR duration, right? If you get a if your MRD at four but you're not at six, that's probably a really bad subset of patients. But even that we don't know for certain. So I, I think we have to be standardized in terms of the test we use, when we use it, and how we use it. I think there's more and more criticism on the how do we test MRD. Um, flow cytometry is widely used, but the problem is that we lose plasma cells, you know, when the samples uh, float around for more than 24 hours and automatically get MRD negative. So I think uh, the timing, that's correct. When do we do MRD negativity? It doesn't make sense to do it at four months for all patients, because if you are clearly only in a partial remission, you don't need to estimate, you know, the MRD negativity. What is the impact of the dynamic to achieve MRD negativity on the outcome? Those are all open questions. We know it's important, but we need also, again, fine tuning here. Yeah, I agree. I, in my own practice, I still outside the context of clinical trials do not look for MRD because I do not know what to do with the information. Uh, I think uh, once we can uh, make decisions uh, going uh, prospectively with the results, it would have added value. But we have worked very hard on MRD yes. uh, and uh, we have set up both flow cytometry and we also have sequencing based assays in real time. Uh, we have that for standard of care. Uh, I, to me, it's very obvious that the sequencing based assays are going to, to be the ones that are going to move forward. They are more sensitive uh, and they are more reliable predictors of progression free survival. And there was actually an abstract that was uh, an oral presentation here at ASH from Hervé Aveloison which was the final updated analysis of the IFM 2009 randomized phase three trial. And they showed uh, that uh, on top of the New England Journal publication this year that was based on flow cytometry MOD, now they reanalyzed with sequencing based assays that were 10 times more sensitive. And if you do that, they found that the PFS was the same for patients transplanted versus not transplanted in an upfront setting. That was not the primary endpoint, mm -hmm. sure. but it addresses the issue of the importance of having a good assay based on sequencing. But, but that, just to put that in context, because I agree that was really interesting data, that was at 12 to 18 months post-initiation post of therapy. And so it's hard to say transplant or no transplant when you have already made that decision by the time you have that data, right? There are a lot of caveats. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't mean to, to yeah, say yeah, that this yeah. is definitive. I think we, yeah. in general, we usually like to see two studies showing the same thing. Sure, then, sure. then we kind of tend to believe it. Right. But it's a large round of my stride. And I think the key message I get out of this is that having a good mm -hmm. assay is very yes, important. Yes, agreed. And they actually said that we need to revise the criteria and say that 10 to minus 6 should be the new definition. That was their message. Yeah. So that was their opinion. And it's interesting. In Alcyon, the same finding occurred. If you were MRD negative at 10 to the minus 5 in this study, it didn't matter which arm you were on, your PFS looked exactly the same. Right. Yeah. So no matter how you got to the MRD, right. you did equally well. So, so a couple of things, lots of learned lessons from this experience, but clearly one is that you can combine DARA with lots of different therapeutics. Is this applicable to the U.S. patient population? It's a bit unclear about that. There's other therapeutics like VRD and KRD, which also have higher MRD rates, and so those combinations will be important to look for. I'm really trying to nail down this exact assay for how we do it, when we do it, and how we interpret it, and then how we act upon it will be important as well. So.